Today we're discussing a work by the late Victorian poet and novelist Thomas Hardy, titled The Darkling Thrush. And before we begin discussing the poem proper, there are two terms that will be helpful in our study of this particular poem by Hardy. The first term is meliorism. Hardy would be known as a meliorist. And meliorism essentially is the belief that humanity has a positive or optimistic impact on progress, social advancement, and perhaps even the world itself. That Hardy very much believed in the power of the human spirit, human passion, to have a good effect on man's surroundings, on nature, and of course on the progress of civilization. And that concept, as it applies to Hardy, will come into play about halfway through this particular poem. And then secondly, Hardy was a late Victorian writer, uh, essentially meaning that unlike Dickens and Tennyson, who were the major players throughout Queen Victoria's reign, Hardy came into the scene toward the end of the 19th century. He started his career as a novelist, uh, and as he advanced in his career, upsetting the censor and upsetting popular, popular sentiment and sensibilities about what ought to be in novels. Uh, Hardy made the transition from novels to poetry and never looked back. And so The Darkling Thrush represents one of Hardy's greatest efforts uh, in his poetic career. And so we'll see his meliorism uh, come into play. But most importantly about his position as a late Victorian writer is that late Victorians generally carry a more cynical, a bleaker attitude or outlook toward life, uh, toward nature, and so on, primarily due to the influence of Darwin's publication in the 1850s of The Origin of Species, which greatly reduced and diminished, in many people's opinion, uh, the dignity, the uniqueness of the human frame, of the human being, that we are no longer made in the image of God. Rather, we are the end result and the byproduct of random mutations, natural selection, macroevolution, and so on. And so because this is the case, what Darwin's theory put forward that human beings were simply beasts, were simply animals in the evolutionary cycle, that the sense of human dignity, human strength, human significance was rather diminished, and you'll see a bit of that popping up in Hardy's work as well, this bleak outlook on life and on nature and on the human soul, so-called. So let's get to the poem, The Darkling Thrush. First, the title, a thrush is a small bird. Uh, he will appear in stanza three of the poem, and darkling simply means in the dark, and that adjective will become important as we begin the poem to see the sort of setting and certainly the tone that Hardy evokes as he begins his poem. We start with the first person narrator, I, perhaps unreliable here, certainly biased, and certainly subjective here. Hardy's creating a persona here. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. Now right off the bat we notice that Hardy is relying on conventional poetic methods, rhyme scheme and meter. However, the setting here he evokes uh, is rather dim and dismal. Frost is specter gray. This rather haunted landscape, ghostly, foreboding, calling to mind a quite somber and funereal sort of tone. Frost is specter gray, winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. You see this language of reduction, this language of decay, weakening, wasting. And notice what the speaker here in the poem is doing. He's leaning on a gate, looking out over this English landscape, and remarking on not the fullness of it, but rather the dearth, the lack, the emptiness, 
those of you who may have seen my videos on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland can certainly see some parallels here. Hardy perhaps is foreshadowing what Hardy, what Eliot rather, will ultimately come to capture in The Wasteland just a number of years after. Winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. Now this is an important moment here of the poem. It's early on, but it's quite significant. This is no Renaissance poem. This isn't Shakespeare, where uh, the sun is the source of both light and warmth. It is the center of our universe. It is uh, the fixed, stable source of power, source of life. Rather, here it is weakening and decaying. And Hardy describes it as an eye, the eye in the sky, which evokes a sort of religious inf uh, implication. The sun is the great eye of day that sees all. As I said, it provides life to all upon which it looks. All of nature needs the sun. Human life needs the sun. And yet the sun is weakening, waning in this poem, this image of sunset that Hardy begins with, he portrays it as a sort of gradual blinding, a gradual blindness that is uh, presiding over all of nature. The eye of day is losing its sight. We are no longer watched. We are no longer cared for, perhaps. And so this opening landscape is quite bleak and dim. Now I'm going to jump here and make a contextual argument concerning the publication for this poem. December 31st, 1900 is when The Darkling Thrush was published, noticeably the last day of the 19th century. And so what Hardy is doing here, both figuratively in the poem with this opening setting and this opening scene, but also just with the purpose of the poem, it, this is perhaps a farewell to the 19th century and all of its change, all of its tumult. Uh, a lot has happened in the last hundred years. It was only a hundred years earlier, in 1798, that Coleridge and Wordsworth published lyrical ballads, what many believe to mark the advent of the Romantic Age, the Romantic spirit of transcendence and beauty, imagination and sublime power through nature, the divine communicated to us through the natural world. Here Hardy is flipping that over and saying perhaps those Forms, perhaps those ideas no longer satisfy. Yeah, they are no longer sufficient for our causes. And he is looking into the, 20, the 20th century. Uh, perhaps it looks specter gray and desolate and weakened. This is the sunset of his life, the sunset of the era, moving into night. Now that idea of the decline of the Romantic Age is certainly going to come into play in the next four lines. Hardy says, The tangled bind stems score the sky like strings of broken lyres. So here the speaker goes from moving out to moving up. A very romantic notion of looking up into the sky for a source of truth, uh, some answers to our cosmic questions. Yet here, his view of the sky is restricted and obscured by tangled bind stems, these climbing plants that have knotted together and tangled together to hinder his ability to see not only the sun, which is already weakened, but to look beyond the sky, to look out into the heavens, to look for God even. He says they scored the sky, and notice this simile here, like strings of broken lyres. Now that certainly brings to mind a romantic image, certainly of Coleridge's poem, The Aeolian Harp, where Coleridge, Coleridge describes a harp that would sit at the window, and as the wind from outside would move through the window, it would vibrate and breathe through the strings of the harp, making beautiful music. And his point there, perhaps being that nature quite literally inspires, breathes in, uh, through our mortal instruments, our voices, our human frames, our pens, our harps, our lyres, and creates from that this mysterious, sublime beauty that we call music or poetry, that we are inspired by a muse. Here, though, the lyres have been broken. These strings 
no longer are able to be played. They are broken and tangled and knotted and restricting our transcendent view of the above, the heavens, the atmosphere. We are no longer able to see, which is the prime function of the poet, to see what cannot be seen, to look into what Wordsworth would call the very way of things, through nature, through the imagination, through art and the process. Here, Hardy says, all of that is falling apart, nodding up. All of it is being reduced and diminished. And to add upon that, he says, all mankind, this universalizing statement, all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. Notice that movement. All mankind that once drew near, haunted nigh to a center, the sun, nature, God, human significance, meaning itself, they now seek their household fires. This image of isolation, escape. They're seeking shelter, certainly, but it is distanced from one another. They're no longer, they are no longer gathered as a community, but rather they have retre retreated into their individual homes. He continues, The land's sharp features seemed to be the century. Remember, he might be talking about the 20th century here that he is closing the door on. It was the century's corpse outlent, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. Now here we've moved from specter gray, desolate imagery to that of a cadaver, this rotted corpse. The cloudy canopy of the world is his crypt, the, the world is a, tomb, is a tomb, a grave, and the wind his death lament. Not this inspiring song, not Coleridge's Aeolian harp, where you have the muse and the spirit of inspiration in nature, but rather wind as death lament, wind as sorrow, wind as messenger of or harbinger of a coming doom. He says the ancient pulse of germ and birth, this life force, this timeless sense of energy and electricity and movement and soul that permeated all of history, all of mankind, germ and birth, seed and birth, is now shrunken hard and dry. These reversals are stunning. That what was once meaningful, true, good, beautiful, life-affirming has now been lost, reduced, shrunken. Every spirit he goes from all mankind to every spirit now upon earth seemed fervorless. A loss of this pulse. Fervorless. Restless. Lacking movement. Lacking spirit. Lacking energy. So these first two stanzas are quite empty and quite bleak in their outlook. Perhaps the 19th century, the 19th century is ending, in the words of Eliot, not with a bang, but a whimper. That... Hardy, and perhaps even all mankind, are limping out of this century into a brave new world, into this 20th century that is no more promising than the last. Yet, Hardy makes quite an extraordinary shift here. At once, suddenly, immediately, this very drastic shift in tone and in content here, almost giving the, we the reader whiplash here, and here's where we begin to see Hardy's meliorism pop up. In the midst of all of this bleakness and all this decay, a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead. Notice this verb of resurrection. This voice rises up out of the bleakness in full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. Full-hearted and joy are quite the contrasting terms here for what we've seen in stanzas one and two. That this voice, and notice how it is introduced into the poem. It's behind a veil. It is shrouded, and it's mysterious, it's romantic. This voice in the distance, almost uh, in the words of Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, that there's this lovely voice out there that is intoxicating, rising up out of the bleakness. And this voice belongs to an aged thrush, the thrush of our title, which is massively important. Hardy here might be alluding to the myth of the phoenix. 
we see the voice of this bird rising up out of the ashes, reborn and resurrected out of death into life, full heartedness and joy illimited or unlimited. But notice what he describes this bird to be. It's an aged thrush, an aged thrush, frail, gaunt, small, and then blast beruffled plume. My students get a kick out of that phrase. Blast beruffled plume. You get this image of this small, gaunt bird, disheveled, ragged, weakened, uh, approaching death himself as an aged bird here. By inference, a bird who may have seen a, a bit of the twentieth of the nineteenth century himself. Frail and gaunt, small. The last model for power, strength, rebirth in this kind of barren wasteland. And yet, here's what Hardy gives us. And perhaps the pivotal word for this stanza, for this bird, and perhaps even the poem itself, lies in the action that the thrush takes. The aged thrush, his voice rising among, uh, among the bleak twigs, he chose, this thrush had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. This is the growing gloom of the setting, of the century that we've already talked about. And yet the thrush chooses to fling his soul upon it. What effect or what impact that might have, no one can say. This is a small bird singing, perhaps alone, in the face of so much death and bleakness. And yet, Hardy says he chose to do it. And that, for us, redeems the sense of the will, the sense of the power of choice, of individual effort against the odds, against logic, against the atmosphere, against our environments. We see an aged thrush, the most unlikely of sources, flinging a full-hearted, joyful song against the gloom, like a penny in a wishing well. No idea the outcome, no idea what effect it might bring, yet he flings his entire being, not just his mind, not his consciousness, not his art, not his scientific progress or advancement, the thrush flings his soul. So perhaps what was the decline of Romanticism and Romantic thought with the broken liars is being redeemed here with this image of a bird, this small figure of nature, flinging his soul against the growing gloom. And Hardy concludes, so little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound. Notice that there's no reason, no logic to this which flies in the face of Hardy's Victorian age. Everything has an enlightened explanation. Our origins are no longer mysterious. They no longer require faith. Evolutionary processes. Freud is coming on the scene telling us our dreams are the key to who, are, who we are. Our id explains our behavior. Our genetics. Our heredity. All of these things explain us. And yet here, Hardy is at a loss. And perhaps is able to offer no explanation. These carolings of ecstatic sound. Interestingly, ecstatic is the word Hardy uses. Literally, ecstasis. To be removed from one's place. Perhaps that's the only answer here. To be removed from one's place. Ecstasis out of this bleak, specter-gray, desolate place into a realm of hope, a, rea a realm of joy and music. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around. Here again is that universal image. Distance, nearness, None, none provide any reason for this bird song, and yet it is offered completely, unlimited. That I could think there trembled through his happy goodnight air some blessed hope, whereof he knew, and I was unaware. 
we're back to this ancient pulse, the life force running throughout all of nature and throughout all of human life like a current, like this electric stream uh, permeating the hearts and souls of the cosmos, the hearts and souls of human figures and human individuals. Reminded of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, God's Grandeur, the way he puts it, that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. That's the sense we get here. There is something on the move. There is something, the bird is on the wing. There is something in the air. There is a crisp newness out there, embodied in this aged thrush song that provides some kind of hope. Again, Hardy can't name it. We can't quantify it or define it because perhaps it's undefinable. This hope, this optimism, this spirit of renewal that comes at the turn of the century. The window into something new, something coming, that this song is reminding the speaker of, and though he can't define it, he cannot contain it, it's some hope he recognizes that nature knows, and we do not. The thrush knows there's reason to sing, and reason to find joy, even though the speaker and we, by association, remain unaware. And it reminds us, too, that perhaps human progress, social advancement, civilization, uh, all of these things perhaps are not the key to true understanding and true wisdom. Perhaps only nature knows the hope on the air, the life that trembles, and we are unaware. Perhaps human beings in all of our intellectual stature, all of our might, the grandeur of our science and of our exploration, perhaps they will never satisfy the longing to know. Perhaps they will never supply us an answer. Perhaps we will always be unaware and yet uh, always longing and always yearning. And it's nature, this aged thrush, that teaches us to hope.